cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi ta'ala na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina min yahdihi allahu fala mudilla lah wa min yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا وسيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد إن شاء الله this is the first of the two lectures entitled the two عمرs and the two عمرs that we're referring to are عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه and عمر بن عبد العزيز رحمه الله تعالى and there is a connection between the two Umars other than that they share the first name. So inshallah I will also mention this connection as we go along. The reason why I chose the two Umars to speak about and why I've connected these two Umars is because when we ever look at something like a sport, so you guys like really like your hockey and basketball and these kind of sports, whenever you have a sport or football or any other type of sport, you will find that there is always an A team and a B team. There's always the A team that you feel when you're in the finals or it's a championship match. And then you have your B, B team or the reserve team. When the A team gets injured, you replace them. And when we would put this concept into practice with regards to the companions radiallahu anhum, or the scholars of Islam rahimahumullahu ta'ala, we can also have an A team. Now this doesn't mean that the rest of those scholars that don't make your A-team are you know, worthless or that they don't have any worth or value. No. They are still great scholars of Islam. But when we look at the companions of the Prophet wasallam, we know that the Prophet wasallam chose some companions and he gave them a special status over all of the other companions. So for example, the Prophet wasallam mentioned that those who accepted Islam before the conquest of Mecca are better than those who accept Islam after the conquest of Mecca. And we also know that those who participated in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah are better than those who accepted Islam after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And we also know that those who were present during the Battle of Badr are better than those who were not present during the Battle of Badr. And we also know that the early wants to accept Islam are better than those who accepted Islam later. And from amongst all of those we also know that there are ten companions that the Prophet ﷺ chose above all of the other companions and he promised them paradise within this world before his death and before they even died. He promised that they would enter into Jannah, that they would be from the people of paradise. And from amongst them is Umar radiallahu anhu. So these 10 companions, if you like, would be in the A team. They would be your star team. Because the Prophet ﷺ chose them over all of the other companions. Now this doesn't mean that all of the other companions therefore have no merit or value. No. But it means that these 10 companions have a status that that the Prophet ﷺ gave to them over every other single companion. And we can do something similar also when it comes to the scholars of Islam. So there are certain scholars of Islam whom the other scholars say were from the best of scholars. And from amongst them is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala. So this is the reason why I've chosen to speak about these two Umars. When it comes to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and we're going to start with him first. Many of us have heard of the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. We've heard it over and over again. We've read the articles, we've read the books, we've heard the CDs, we've attended the lectures. So what I've tried to do here for this lecture is not to go over those facts about Umar's life which are well known. Those things which everyone reads and hears and is well known. But I've tried to pick parts of the life of Umar radiallahu anh and aspects of his life that aren't as well known. So that inshallah it won't be something which you've heard over and over again and there won't be too much repetition. One of the first things that I want to focus on when it comes to the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh I want to focus on his background. And this is very important. Because when we think about Umar radiallahu anhu, the first thing that comes to our mind is what? He's harsh, he's tough, he's severe. 
You know, he has that personality which makes people frightened. This is his personality. So we automatically think this about Umar radiallahu anhu. So to study his background, it will show us why Umar radiallahu anhu developed this personality and how he became the way he was. So the first thing that I want to discuss is his appearance. It is said that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an was a man who had a handsome face. It is said that he had beautiful eyes, a beautiful nose, beautiful cheeks. He was a man who was handsome. And not only that, but he was a man who was built. So he wasn't too fat and he wasn't too thin. He was built. So he wasn't someone who was on the thin side, no someone who had too much meat was on the fat side. But rather he was someone who was just right, he was built. And it is also said that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an was taller than most people. He was taller than most people. And so if people were walking in a group, Umar radiallahu anhu would stick out. You would see him first. He would stand above everyone else. And some of the companions mention it was as if he was riding an animal. This is how tall he used to stick out. It would seem that everyone else is walking and Umar is on an animal. He's on something which is propping him up. This is how tall he used to be. And he would have long mustaches. So the ends of his mustache would come down and they were long. And they would slightly curl at the ends. And it is said that when he would become worried or when something would worry him or distress him, he would play with the ends of his mustache whilst he was thinking. This was the way Umar radiallahu anhu was. And he was also someone who was given this very beautiful description that I want to share with you. And I think the whole personality of Umar, the whole appearance of Umar radiallahu anhu can be summarized within this. One of the people described him and he said, إِذَا مَشَى أَسْرَعْ وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ أَسْمَعْ وَإِذَا ضَرَبَ أَوْجَعْ Three things that Umar radiallahu anhu, three things that describe him perfectly. The first is that if he walks, he walks fast. If he walks, he walks fast. So he's not one of those people that takes a long time getting from point A to B. He walks with speed. He walks with a purpose. And we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that when Umar radiallahu anhu goes down one valley, Shaytan leaves it and he goes down another path. He leaves the path of Umar out of the way he is and out of his harshness and his uh, close station to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first thing. When Umar radiallahu anhu would walk, he would walk fast. The second thing, وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ asma, And when he spoke, he would make sure that you heard him. So he's one of those people who had a very commanding voice. When he spoke, you definitely heard him. He wasn't one of those people where you thought, you know, what did he say? Shall I go and ask him again? You definitely heard what he was going to say. And the third thing is, وَإِذَا ضَرَبَ أَوْجَعَ And if he hit you, you felt it. When he struck someone, that person knew that he was hit by Umar radiallahu anhu. And people would fear this about Umar. They would fear his strike. And he would often go around during his khilafah with a stick. And stories are well known. And even some of the companions who were great companions, radiallahu anhum, they were great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Umar wouldn't hesitate when he came to beating them with his stick. And it was reported that once he went into the masjid, masjid al Nabawi during the day, and he found some young men just sitting there. Young men who were spending their time in the masjid, youth. So he went up to them and he said to them, what are you doing? So they said, we're sitting in the masjid, we're chilling out, you know, we're, we're sitting and spending our time in the masjid. So Umar radiallahu anhu took his stick and he began to beat them. And he said to them, go out and work. We are not monks in our religion. There's no concept of being a monk in our religion. You don't stay in the masjid all day. Go out and earn a living, support your family, go and work. And he would beat them with his stick. And people would remember this about Umar radiallahu anhu. Some of the great companions like Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and others when it came to the beatings of Umar, they would run. They would be scared. So we all know the famous story of Umar radiallahu an. Abu Musa al-Ashari goes and knocks on his door three times. Umar doesn't respond. So Abu Musa walks away. So Umar comes and says, why did you walk away after three? Three times you knock and then you walk away. And he says, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa commanded us to do this. So Umar had never heard the hadith. So he said, either you bring a witness or I'm going to make an example out of you. So Abu Musa al-Ashari runs and he goes and he looks for the companions and he's saying, who will support me? Who's going to vouch for me? Who's going to say that he heard the Prophet ﷺ say this? Otherwise, Umar is going to sort me out. 
And this is, and Abu Musa al-Ashari is not just any companion, he's not like, you know, someone that's unknown. He's one of the major, most famous companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But this was the way that Umar radiallahu anhu was. Now what's interesting here is Umar radiallahu anhu developed this personality from his childhood. And he developed this personality because his father, Al-Khattab, was a very harsh and severe father. He was someone who was very strict with his son. And Umar radiallahu anhu mentions that when he was a young boy, he would be a shepherd for the sheep and the goat of his father. And in some narrations, for the sheep and the goats of his aunties. And he would work the whole day being a shepherd. He's a young boy. The whole day he would work as being a shepherd, going into the desert, grazing with the sheep. And he would spend the whole day in the long, hot summer heat. And at the end of the day, all he would get in return was a handful of dates. This was his wage. And day in and day out, he would do this. He would be a shepherd. So he was someone who grew up in a very strict environment. And he would say that if my father found me doing something else or slacking off on my job, he would beat me severely. He would beat me severely. So this was the way that Umar radiallahu anhu grew up. And this helps you to know why he developed this personality. Many people develop their personalities because of the way they're brought up, because of the way their, pa- their, their parents are and their own personalities. So Umar radiallahu anhu had someone who was a very harsh father to him. And it's reported that one day, Umar radiallahu anhu, whilst he was the Khalifa, he stood upon the minbar in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the people gathered around him. He was going to give them a sermon. So he praised Allah and he sent salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then he said, "By Allah, I remember when I was a young boy, back in Mecca, and I would be a shepherd." for the goats and the sheep of my father and my aunties, and I would work the whole day without taking a break, and all they would give me in return was a handful of dates. And then he went off the minbar. That's all he said. So the people gathered around expecting Umar to say something important, and this is all he said. He just told them his background and how he was treated when he was young. So when he came off the minbar, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, radiyallahu an, one of the great companions, he came to Umar and he said, O oh, Amir al Mu'minin, O oh, leader of the believers, all you've done today is humiliate yourself. You've done yourself no favors. All you've done is humiliate yourself. You didn't need to tell people how you were treated when you were a young boy. Now people will think all he was was a lowly shepherd and you're the leader of the Muslims. So Umar radiallahu anhu said to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, My soul, my nafs was telling me, that today I am the most powerful and richest man in the world. He's the Khalifa of the Muslims. He's conquered the Persians and the Romans. He's the richest man if he wanted to be. He's the most powerful man on the earth. He's saying, my soul was telling me that today, Umar, there is no one more powerful to you. It was planting the seeds of arrogance and pride into my heart. So I stood upon the minbar and said what I said in order to humiliate and humble myself, to show myself where my origins were, where my roots were. This is how I started, and that I'm nothing special. So subhanAllah, look at Umar radiallahu an, and this small incident shows you the personality of Umar. Yes, he was harsh, yes, he was severe, but at the same time, he had this humble, and he had this humbleness and this humility in his approach and personality. When he came to the religion of Allah, when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would have this humbleness and humility. But what's really interesting here about the personality of Umar, his background, is whenever we think about Umar, Umar radiallahu anhu is always harsh. He's always severe. He's always the strictest person. He's always the most fiercest when it comes to defending Islam. But the question I have is that there is someone who even Umar was scared of. There was someone who even Umar used to be scared of. Does anyone know who he was? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Now when we think about Abu Bakr, we think gentle and soft, and merciful. This is what we think of Abu Bakr. But Umar is saying that he's scared of Abu Bakr. How does this make sense? You know when you think, like if I was to ask someone, who do you think Umar was scared of? People would normally think Khalid ibn al-Walid, or someone like one of the other warriors, or one of the other powerful generals. They will think that this is, these are the kind of people that Umar would be scared of. No, 
Umar wasn't scared of any of them. But he was scared of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And he used to say radiallahu an about Abu Bakr, Kuntu udari minhu ba'd al had. When it came to the anger of Abu Bakr, even I would stay away. Because Abu Bakr was merciful, he was gentle, he was kind. But when he came to the religion of Islam and defending it, when he came to the honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr was more fierce and more strict than even Umar. And this is why when you look through the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever Umar radiallahu anhu is doing something, that, and someone needs to calm him down, who calms him down? Who is the one who always says to Umar, calm down, sit down, hold back? It's always Abu Bakr. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, even though he's, he's, he's angry and the people are staying away out of his way because they don't want to be you know, harmed by him, when Abu Bakr comes, he just says, sit down, and Umar just goes away. Because he's scared of the wrath of Abu Bakr. He knows Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, better than anyone else. And this is why I'll just give you one simple example of this. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, and Umar radiallahu anh, is in Masjid al Nabawi with his sword out, and he's saying to the people, whoever says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is dead, then I will chop his head off. Who is there to go and say anything to Umar? No one says, everyone just moves out the way. Let Umar say what he wants, let him do what he wants, we'll just sit in the corners. So everyone goes. Until eventually Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes in, and he wants to speak. So what does he say to Umar? Does he go and start negotiating? Does he start you know, calming him down? Is there some counseling going on? No. Sit down, O son of Khattab. That's all he says, sit down. And Umar just quietly sits down. So Umar radiallahu anh, even though he had his personality and he had it for the sake of Islam, when it came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, even he would be scared. And subhanAllah, this is a beautiful concept in Islam. That it's not about your personality, whether you got a soft personality normally or whether you got a harsh personality normally. What it matters is how you portray this personality when it comes to Islam, when it comes to the Quran, when it comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because Abu Bakr was the gentlest and kindest of people, but when he came to Islam and something was haram, or someone was doing something contradictory to Islam, then he was like a lion. And he was even more fierce than those people who were normally lions. But if someone has that harsh personality, but when he comes to Islam, he doesn't even use it. When he comes to his fellow brothers and, and sisters, his harsh personality is oppressive and it's unjust, then it doesn't make any sense and it has no value or no merit. And subhanAllah, when um, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was on his deathbed, he wanted to appoint Umar radiallahu anhu as the next Khalifa. So he gathered all of the major companions, and one by one as they were coming in, he was asking them, who do you think I should appoint as the Khalifa? And then he would mention to them that I want to appoint Umar radiallahu anhu, so what do you think? So Ali and Uthman and Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Zubair and all of the major companions, they said, yes, appoint him. He's the best person from amongst us. There's no one better than him. All of them said this except one companion. That companion was Talha ibn Ubaidillah, radiallahu anhu, who was also one of the ten that was promised paradise. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu mentioned it to Talha and he said, I want to appoint Umar. Talha replied and he said, oh, Umar, oh, oh, oh Abu Bakr, what will you say in front of Allah on Yawm al when Allah says to you, why did you appoint someone as harsh and severe as Umar over the Muslims? What response will you give? You know his personality, you know how harsh he is, you know how severe he is, so why are you appointing him as the leader of the Muslims? So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu responded, and he said, if I am asked on Yawm al about this, then I will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I appointed the one who was the best from amongst them. That's why I appointed him. Because there is no one better than Umar. And then he said to Talha, you see him as harsh, you see him as severe, but by Allah, he only does this because he thinks that I am too soft and gentle. And he doesn't want people taking advantage of my good side, my good nature. But when he becomes Khalifa himself, you will find that he will change you will find that his personality will become different. And so he is telling Talha here that he is only being harsh and severe to make a balance. And subhanAllah, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he mentions this beautiful point. 
that when the leader is someone who has a strict, harsh personality, his deputy should be someone who is gentle and soft. And if the leader is someone who is gentle and soft, then his deputy should be someone who is harsh and severe. So there's always that personality. So that people don't think that they can take advantage of the soft one, or they don't feel that the harsh one will always oppress and do injustice to them. There's always that balance. So Umar radiallahu anhu, when he became the Khalifa, he became soft. Another beautiful thing about the life of Umar radiallahu anhu, is that whenever you look at the life of Umar, he is always at the forefront. He's always at the top. He's always the one that's doing everything. He's always the one that's initiating everything. Any major thing that you want to think about, any battle you want to think about, any major incident during the life of the Prophet ﷺ or during the life of Abu Bakr, Umar is always there at the forefront. And subhanAllah, think about this. Umar anhu has been promised paradise. He can go into paradise. He's got a guarantee. But even so, he is still at the forefront. He's still the one that's working the hardest. Always aiming for better than best. It's not enough that he's just achieved paradise. He wants to continue and he wants the highest ranks of paradise. So he is always at the front. And there are many examples of this. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu first became the Khalifa, Umar radiallahu anhu was walking during the streets and he found that there was a woman there. And that woman was looking for Abu Bakr. So he went to look with her. He went to his house. He went to the masjid. He couldn't find him anywhere. Eventually, he finds him in the marketplace. Abu Bakr is in the marketplace. What's he doing? He's buying and selling. He's doing his trade. So Umar goes to him and he says, Oh Abu Bakr, you are the Khalifa of the Muslims. People are looking for you. They have needs. They have problems. And you're here buying and selling. So Abu Bakr says, I don't have enough money for me and my family to live. Subhanallah. Abu Bakr is the Khalifa. If he wants, he can just go to the treasury, take as much money as he wants. Who's going to say anything to him? But he would rather work. So he's in the market and he's saying there's not enough money for me and my family. So Umar radiallahu anhu says to him, go back and do the work of the Khalifa and we will give you a wage from the treasury of the Muslims. So Umar radiallahu anhu gives him a, treasure, a wage from the treasury. And then after a few days, again he looks for Abu Bakr and again Abu Bakr is nowhere to be found. So again he goes to the marketplace and who's there? Abu Bakr. What's he doing? He's buying and selling again. So he goes, oh, Abu Bakr, haven't we already given you, we've been through this, yeah? this is like deja vu, we've been through this, we've given you a wage and you're back here again? So Abu Bakr says, it's still not enough for my, me and my family. What you gave me is not enough. So Umar says, okay, we'll increase it, go back and do the work of the Khalifa. So Umar radiallahu anhu throughout this Khilafah of Abu Bakr, he's always there with him, always his deputy, always helping him. In another incident, when Abu Bakr first became the Khalifa, there were many, many issues that he had to deal with. There were people who refused to pay the zakah. There were people who had apostated from Islam. The Romans and the Persians were attacking the Muslims. There were people who claimed to be prophets after the Prophet wasallam. So there were many issues. So Umar radiallahu anhu came to Abu Bakr and he said to him, Oh Abu Bakr, allow me to be your judge of Medina. You be the Khalifa, you worry about the affairs of the Muslims. As for me, I will deal with the affairs, the day-to-day -day affairs that the problems of the people of Medina have. Allow me to be your judge. So Abu Bakr agrees. And he says to him, go ahead. So Umar radiallahu anhu remains in this position as judge for a whole year. And after a year, he comes to Abu Bakr and he gives him his resignation. He hands in his resignation. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says to him, is it because of the difficulty of the job? Because there's so much pressure, there's so many problems with this job, is this why you're resigning? So Umar radiallahu anhu says, no, it's not because of this. But for the whole year that I've been judge, not a single case has come before me. No two Muslims have disputed before me. So it's not that I don't want the job, there's just no need for the job. You don't need a judge, no one has any problems. Every single Muslim knows their rights, so they take their rights with justice. And every single Muslim knows the rights of others upon them, so they give people their rights with justice. This is the community that they were living in, radiallahu anhum. Subhanallah. And this doesn't necessarily mean that people didn't dispute. They disputed. People always dispute. 
But when they would know what the truth is, whose right is where, they would solve it. They didn't need to go all the way to the judge. And they didn't need to go to Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu at any time, in any stage of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the life of Abu Bakr, he was always at the forefront. Umar radiallahu anhu was the one who was always at the forefront. And then when he becomes Khalifa radiallahu anhu himself, he's still at the forefront. He is still the one that's doing everything. Umar radiallahu an, one of the most beautiful aspects of his life is that he throughout his life preserved Tawheed. Anytime he thought that someone was going to come in and destroy Tawheed or cast doubts upon Tawheed, he would be there at the forefront defending Tawheed. And this is something which we need to realize. Many times we go about our daily lives and we go and we visit our friends and our cousins and our relatives and they may be doing stuff which weakens their tawheed. In one way or another, shirk might be creeping in, or they may be performing bid'ahs and innovations. Something may be happening which weakens their tawheed. But we remain quiet, and we think it's not a big deal, and we move along. Umar radiallahu an, when he would even smell anything similar to shirk, he would put his foot down and he would stop it. So that shirk wouldn't come in during his life. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned that the fitan, the trials and tribulations will not affect this ummah until a gate is breached, until a gate is unlocked. And when the companions were asked, who was this gate? What did this gate refer to? They said it referred to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned that during the life of Umar, because of the way he was, no trials would affect this ummah. And this is why during his life there were no problems. The Persians were conquered, the Romans were conquered, Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa were all conquered. And it was all during his life, radiyallahu anhu. He was that gate that locked all of this. And I'll give you a couple of examples from this. One of them is that when he's performing Hajj or Umrah, and he's going around the Kaaba, making Tawaf. And he comes to the black stone and he kisses it. And then he says, not for his own benefit, but for the benefit of the people around him, he says, I know that you are only a stone. You don't benefit and you don't harm. And if it wasn't that I saw the Prophet ﷺ kissing you, I would not kiss you. Showing to the people, showing to those around him, that we know that it is only Allah who harms and benefits. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we kiss the stone, it's not because we think the stone will answer our du'as, or the stones will forgive our sins, or this black stone, even though it is a holy stone, we don't believe that it will enter us into paradise or preserve us from Jannah, uh, from Jahannam, from the fire. But it's only because we're following the sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in everything we do, we know that Allah azza wa jal is the one who is the real Lord and he is the one who controls everything. So Umar radiallahu anhu throughout his life, he's always preserving tawheed. In another example of this, when Umar radiallahu anhu first became the Khalifa, one of the first things that he did was replace the military general of that time. The general during the time of Abu Bakr of the armed forces was Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. One of the first things that Umar radiallahu anhu does when he becomes Khalifa is replaces Khalid ibn al-Walid. And he replaces him with Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, another of the great companions. And so people were coming to Umar and complaining. Because Khalid was a military genius. When he came to being military leader, a military leader, Khalid was the best. And he was fighting the Romans and he was fighting the Persians and he was winning. So they would come to Umar and they would say, why are you replacing someone who's so good? Khalid is good. Why are you replacing someone that's beating everyone? So Umar radiallahu anhu replied, and look at this beautiful response. Umar radiallahu anhu says, because of exactly what you're saying. People are becoming so attached to the leadership of Khalid that they think that we're only given victory because of Khalid ibn al-Walid. When Khalid ibn al-Walid is in the army, people think they'll win. When Khalid ibn al-Walid isn't there, they'll think they'll lose. Everything is entrusted to Khalid. They put their tawakkul in Khalid. All of their affairs are in the hands of Khalid. They think Khalid is the one that brings them victory and defeat. 
So he wanted to show the companions and all the other Muslims that victory and defeat are not because of Khalid ibn al-Walid or anyone else. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So he removed Khalid ibn al-Walid and he appointed Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. And what happened? The Muslims continued to be victorious. And they continued to dominate the Persians and the Romans and they conquered Bayt al-Maqdis and they did so much. Showing the importance again of Tawheed. When people become attached to a personality and they think that that personality is the one that drives the creation, drives the universe, gives victory and defeat, now shirk is creeping into the ummah. And it's not something which many of us would think about. Most of us would say, no, keep Khalid, he's doing an excellent job. But we don't think about how shirk can come in from so many different ways. And it's hidden forms. How many prevalent hidden forms of shirk there are. So Umar radiallahu anhu was someone who thought of the future of the ummah. And he knew what it would lead to. So he told them, no. Khalid will be removed and he will be replaced by Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu arda. So he replaces him with Abu Ubaidah. When Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was about to pass away, when he was many years later on, when he was on his deathbed, he would say to those around him, me and Umar differed many times. We had a lot of differences of opinion. But now that I think in hindsight about what Umar did, I know that he only did what he did for the betterment of this ummah. This is Khalid ibn walid himself saying this on his deathbed. When I think about things in hindsight, when I look back at everything that Umar did, I know that what he did was for the best of this ummah, for the betterment of this ummah. It wasn't anything personal. He didn't have any problems against like Khalid ibn walid but it was for the betterment of this ummah and for Islam. And this is Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu saying this himself. When he became Khalifa radiallahu anhu, when Umar ibn Khattab becomes the Khalifa, he changes his personality. Just as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said he would. So he's still harsh and severe when he needs to be, but he's also very merciful and very generous and kind with the Muslims, especially with the weak Muslims, especially with the poor Muslims. On one occasion, and Umar ibn al-Khattab, by the way, has the same problem that Abu Bakr did. One day they come to Umar radiallahu an, and they find that he's complaining about his wage. And he's saying that it's not enough for me and for my family. So the companions say to him, choose a wage for yourself. Choose what you want. So Umar ibn al-Khattab says, I want my wage. I want three things. Number one, I want an animal upon which I can go for Hajj and Umrah, a riding beast. Number two, I want two sets of clothes, one in the winter and one in the summer. And number three, I want enough food for me and my family. Subhanallah. And the Muslims are at a time when they have so much wealth. They've taken over Persia and Rome, the two superpowers. They have all of their treasures and all of their wealth. The Muslim treasury has more wealth than at any time in its history. And Umar can take as much as he wants. And no one would have said to Umar, no, you can't take it. Everyone would have agreed and they would have happily given it to him. But Umar says, no, just one animal, two sets of clothes in a year. Not just like, uh, you know, every week or every day or every month, in a year. And enough food for me and my family. And subhanAllah, during his khilafah one time, he doesn't even come out for the Jum'ah prayer, he comes out late. And when he comes out, he's all dripping and all wet. So the companions say, oh Umar, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. So he says, I only have one thaw, only one pair of clothes. So I had to wash it on a Friday in order to make it clean. So that's what delayed me. I was washing my clothes and it took me more time than usual. So Umar radiallahu an, this is his wage as the Khalifa of the, the leader of Islam, the Khalifa of the Muslims. And when one year, when there was a, when there was a famine and drought in Medina, and the people had hardly any food. There was famine and drought everywhere in Medina. Umar radiallahu an, himself prevented himself and his own family from eating luxurious foods. And he would survive upon what everyone else was surviving on, grain and rice. And he wouldn't eat any type of fat or anything which the Muslims, the general Muslims, could not get hold of. Even when he was given stuff from Persia and Rome and all of these places, fruits and other stuff, he would say, no, I will not eat anything that the general Muslims do not have. And this is what he inflicted upon himself. Radiallahu anhu arta. Something else which shows his nature whilst he was Khalifa was that he always had time for the Muslims. 
even though he's got this massive empire that stretches through so many continents, he still has time for the Muslims of Medina. So Umar radiallahu anhu is once walking along with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. And as they're walking, they find that an old woman comes to them. And the woman comes and she begins to complain to Umar. And she's saying and complaining to Umar that she's too poor, that she's too weak, that no one is looking after her. And she's complaining and complaining and complaining in front of the Khalifa. So Umar radiallahu anhu begins to cry. And he cries and he cries and he cries. Until Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says to the woman, O oh woman, enough. Do you not see that you've made the Khalifa cry? Isn't that enough for you? So Umar radiallahu anhu turns to Sa'ad and he says, O oh Sa'ad, let her continue. Let her continue. For indeed, the one who is above the heavens, he hears her cry. So it is only befitting that the one upon the earth also hears her cry. Subhanallah. This is the level of humility that Umar radiallahu anhu has and his humbleness. That the one above the heavens can hear you cry, hear her cry. So it's only befitting that the one upon the earth can also hear her cry. During another time, Umar radiallahu anhu is doing his nightly patrols. And this is something which we know about Umar radiallahu anhu during his whole life. Even though he was the Khalifa, during the night he would still patrol himself on his own many times. He would still go around patrolling the alleyways of Medina, making sure everyone is well, making sure everyone is safe. So Umar radiallahu anhu is once going through the alleyways of Medina and he hears a man shouting out for help, crying out for help. So Umar radiallahu anhu comes across this man and he says, what do you need? And this man doesn't know that who he's speaking to is Umar ibn al-Khattab. So he says to Umar, my wife is in labor, she's about to give birth. And I have no wealth, I have no shelter, I have nothing. There is no help for me. Where is the Khalifa? No one's helping me. So Umar radiallahu anhu goes and he brings his wife. And he makes a shelter. And he says to his wife, go and attend to this man's wife. So she goes to attend. And he says to the man, build a fire, I will bring food for you. So Umar radiallahu anhu goes back. And he carries sacks of grain and rice upon his own back. So his slave sees him and he says, O oh Umar, O oh Amirul Mu'mineen, allow me to carry this for you. Let me carry it for you. Now Umar radiallahu anhu is not only the Khalifa of the Muslims, the most powerful man upon the earth. He is also one who has been guaranteed paradise. He doesn't need to do anything more if he doesn't want to. But he says to his slave, No by Allah. Because on the day of judgment, you will not carry my sins for me. I will carry this myself. So he goes and he goes back to the man and he, he starts to cook for him. He begins to cook and prepare a meal for them. This is the Khalifa himself, cooking and preparing the meal. And then they hear the good news that the wife has given birth. And so he gives him the food and he says, this is for you and for your family. And he says, come to me tomorrow, find me tomorrow and I will give you a monthly wage from the treasury of the Muslims. I will give you a stipend, a, a wage for yourself and your family from the treasury of the Muslims. So after he leaves, this man is amazed. Who is this man who just helped me so much and tomorrow he's promising me money from the treasury of the Muslims. And then he finds out that it's the Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah, look at this. And when we think about welfare and we think about the government help that it, uh, the government help and support that it gives to people, we think that this is something which the West invented. But Umar ibn al-Khattab over 1400 years ago was doing the same. Giving money to the weak and poor Muslims who couldn't afford anything. And he would give them a monthly wage and a monthly stipend from the treasury of the Muslims. This was the way Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was. Once they came to him, an ambassador and a messenger from Persia. He came to give him a message. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is nowhere to be found. This man's an ambassador. He's come all the way from Persia. And he can't find the Khalifa. So he knocks on his house and his son says he's not home. I don't know where he is. So someone says to him, why don't you try the masjid? He goes to the masjid and he's not in the masjid. So he's looking around for Umar and he can't find him anywhere. Eventually he comes to a garden. 
and he finds that Umar radiallahu anhu is sleeping under the shade of a tree. And his sword is hanging up upon the branches of a tree. So this man is amazed because he knows, he knows how the people are during his, from his place, where he comes from, from Persia. How the leader is protected, how many guards he has, how much of an entourage he has. And here he's seeing the Khalifa of the Muslims, the one who's conquering Persians and Romans, and he's asleep in a garden under the shade of a tree, no one around him, and he's even got his own sword hanging on a branch, not even next to him. So he's amazed. And he says, حَكَمْتَ فَعَدَلْتَ فَأَمِنْتَ وَنِمْتَ You ruled and you were just in your rule. You had justice when he came to your rule. So the people gave you security and you were able to sleep like this. Because of the way he ruled, because of the way he was, he was given just, he had justice and the people would give him security and he was able to sleep during the day, not fearing anyone. And he was the one during the night who would walk alone, not fearing anyone. But the people would fear Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu was also someone who respected the scholars. So when he would have his shura, when he would have his counsel that he would ask for advice, one of the people that he placed within this council was Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. And ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah was one of the youngest companions. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he was only 11 or 12 years old. So even during the time of Umar, he's only a teenager. So the people are saying, why have you got Ibn Abbas here? Why? There's so many great major companions, older companions, wiser companions. Why do you insist on having this teenager in your council? So Umar radiallahu anhu wanted to prove to them that it wasn't about age, it was about knowledge. So he said to them, what is the tafsir? What is the explanation of the verse of Allah? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the help of Allah and the victory of Allah comes. What is the meaning of this verse? So the people started mentioning their different interpretations and their different explanations. And then after they finished, he said to Ibn Abbas, what does it mean? And Ibn Abbas said, it shows that the time of the Prophet ﷺ is coming to an end, that he will soon die. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, yes, this is what it means. So he wanted to show the people that it is based upon, upon knowledge and not upon age. And once there was a man who came and he traveled very far. He came to the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. He wanted to meet the companions. So he found that he came to the masjid. And the masjid was empty. And it was nearly prayer time. So he went to the front row and he sat down directly behind the imam. Waiting for the prayer. So the adhan was given. And he was waiting and waiting. And then finally Umar comes out and the iqama is made. He's standing directly behind the imam in the front row. So as soon as the iqamah finishes and Umar radiallahu anhu comes to the front, someone pulls him from behind. And he makes him go to the second row and he stands in his place. So the man's like, what's this? I've been waiting all this time. Now all of a sudden this man just comes and he takes me from my place. So after the prayer finishes, he says to that man, who are you? Well, you know, who are you to come and just pull me away? So Umar radiallahu anhu hears this and he says to him, do you not know who this is? This is the leader of the believers. This is the leader of the believers, Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam instructed us that when the imam comes to pray, the people who stand directly behind him should be the people of knowledge and understanding. It should be those people who stand directly behind the imam just in case he makes a mistake or just in case he needs to leave. And this is what we are taught. And Umar radiallahu anhu would show his respect to those companions. He would call them leader of the believers. And Amir al-Mu'mineen is something which is reserved for the Khalifa. But to show his respect for these companions, he would call them Amir al-Mu'mineen. Another companion that he called Amir al-Mu'mineen was Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. The famous companion, the Mu'addin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He would call him Sayyid al-Muslimin, the leader of the believers. Subhanallah. Look at how Islam propelled this man who was a slave in Jahiliyyah. Before Islam, he was a slave, he was owned, he was worthless, he was not worth anything. But because he became a Muslim and Islam strengthened him and he gave him honor, Umar ibn al-Khattab would call this man who used to be a slave, he would say to him, he is the leader of the Muslims. Radiallahu anhu arda. Umar radiallahu anhu during his time was also someone who oversaw many of 
the conquests of Islam. And one of those conquests was the conquest of Jerusalem. And it's a long story and I don't want to go into all of the detail, but one of the incidents that I want to mention to show you how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu throughout his life, even though he's this leader of Islam, and remember yesterday we mentioned that one of the trials that a person will face is leadership. Look at how Umar radiallahu anhu deals with this. He deals with it with humility and humbleness, with taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never allows himself to feel arrogant or proud of what he's achieved. And he has a right to be proud. Because of what he achieved, he, he oversaw and overmanaged so many things that, are, that happened to the Muslim empire. But he doesn't allow himself to feel proud or arrogant. He goes all the way to Jerusalem because the people of Jerusalem at that time, they conceded defeat, but they said we will only give the keys to, of Jerusalem to the leader of the Muslims, to the Khalifa himself, no one else. So Umar radiallahu anhu goes all the way. And as soon as he comes, and he's coming by the way with his old raggy clothes, and he's coming on a donkey, and he's traveling all the way from Medina, so he's dusty and dirty and disheveled. And he comes towards this place and he finds that there's a puddle. And Ibn Ubayd ibn al-Jarrah, who's the general of the time, he comes to greet Umar. So Umar radiallahu anhu, because there's water in the way, he gets off the donkey and he takes off his sandals, he's carrying them, and he wants to wade through the water in his bare feet. So Abu Ubaidah says to him, O Amir al muminin I don't wish that the people should see you in such a state. These are Romans, these are Persians, these are people who are superpowers. They have royalty, nobility amongst them. If they see you like this and you're the Khalifa, they'll think, you know, what is this? This guy is just a Bedouin. Who is he? What's he going to do? But I want you to have the honor. So I want you to come in a presentable way. SubhanAllah. And Abu Ubaidah is not thinking about himself or Umar's personality. He's thinking about the benefits for Islam. That we should show them strength and honor. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says to Abu Ubaidah, O oh Abu Ubaidah, if anyone other than you had said this to me, I would have made an example out of them. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't give us strength based on anything other than Islam. We are a people who have honor, and power and strength because of Islam. So whenever we leave Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal will cause us to be humiliated. SubhanAllah. Look at this powerful statement amongst all of these people. He's saying to Abu Ubaidah, his own deputy, his general, that our strength comes from our religion, Islam. It's not about what I wear, how much wealth I have, what kind of an animal I'm riding, how I walk, how I sit. Our strength comes from Islam. And when we leave that, even if we have all of this wealth, we have all of these appearances, nothing will save us. We will be humiliated. Something else that took place during the life of Umar radiallahu an was that he was always calling people back to Islam, to hold firmly to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to be strong in their iman. One year there was a severe earthquake in Medina. And after the earthquake, he gathered the people in the masjid. Then he said to them, by Allah, this earthquake only came because of the sins that you are committing. He's saying this to the people of Medina. And the vast majority of people of Medina during his time were still companions. Very few of them are from the next generation, the Tabi'een. The majority of them were still companions. And many, many of them were the major companions. So he's saying to them that this earthquake, this punishment from Allah, is as a result of our own sins. So he said to them, either you stop sinning, or if something else similar comes to this to Medina ever again, I will leave Medina. I will leave staying with you. SubhanAllah, look at this power that he had. He's saying to the people, you are sinning so much that Allah is sending punishment upon us. So either stop sinning, or I'm going to go and live somewhere else. I'm not going to live with the people who sin so much that the punishment of Allah comes upon them. Umar radiallahu anhu, and there are many, many things to mention about Umar radiallahu anhu. But I will conclude and fast forward to the end of his life. Umar radiallahu anhu heard of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that was narrated by Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. So he asked Hudayfa, O oh Hudayfa, do you remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he mentioned that there will be a time when fitna will strike this ummah. There will be many trials and problems that will strike this ummah. But the only thing holding them back is a gate, and that gate is locked. And until that gate is breached, there will be no fitness. 
So Hudayfa said, yes. Oh, Umar, I remember this hadith. So after Umar went away, one of the people sitting with Hudayfa, he said, oh, Hudayfa, what is this gate? What does it refer to? So he replied, it refers to Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu. It refers to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So the narrator asked and he said, Did Umar know that he was the gate? Did Umar know it was referring to him? And Hudayfa replied, Yes. Umar knew that the gate referred to him radiallahu anhu. During the last year of, the, of his life radiallahu anhu, he went for Hajj. Umar radiallahu anhu goes for Hajj. And Hajj was the time that he would meet with all of his governors, all of his generals, and he would meet with the normal people and he would ask them about their governors. What is your governor doing? How is he treating you? What are the people saying about him? He was someone who always knew about the governors, about the affairs of his people. And this was a time when there was no email or internet or phone or anything else. But he would ask the people and he would know about his governors. During that year, his last year in the 23rd year of the Hijrah, he had become old and weak. So he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some narrations at Arafah. He said to Allah, O oh Allah, I have become old and I have become weak. And the people, my Muslim, the Muslim community has become so far spread, so wide. There are so many of them. The empire has expanded so much. It is difficult for me to keep an eye on them. It is difficult for me to manage them. So Allah, allow me to come to you. He made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should allow him to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that same dua, he asked that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him death by martyrdom. And that death should come to him in Medina. So some of the people who heard this, they said, Oh Umar, Medina is the safest place ever. It's the furthest place away from any type of battle or war. How in Medina are you going to become a martyr? Who's going to kill you? But Umar radiallahu anhu made this dua. And then when he returned back to Medina, during that final year, Umar radiallahu anhu one day came out for the Fajr prayer. And whilst he was praying, Abu Lu'lu'a al-Mujusi, one of the disbelievers, who was a servant for one of the companions, one of his slaves, he came and he began to slash Umar. And he cut him very deeply. So Umar radiallahu anhu fell down. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was standing behind him, so he came and he led the prayer and he completed the prayer. And they caught Abu Lu'lu'a and they killed him. So Umar radiallahu anhu is taken home and he's upon his deathbed. And Umar radiallahu anhu is so injured, he's so weak, that even if he drinks something, it comes out of his stomach, it comes out of his intestines. He's been slashed so deeply, nothing will even remain inside. So they knew that he was on his deathbed, that he would pass away. So he says to his son Abdullah ibn Umar, O oh Abdullah, go to the house of Aisha the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and ask her permission that I should be buried next to my two companions. Meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Ask permission that I should be allowed to be buried there. And when you go to her and you knock upon her door, do not say the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Don't say that the leader of the believers is seeking permission. Say Umar ibn al-Khattab is seeking permission because today I am not the leader. He was on his deathbed. Today, I am not the leader of the Muslims. I am just Umar today. So he goes and he asks permission from Aisha. And Aisha says that I had reserved this place for myself. But now that Umar has asked, it makes sense to me that he should be buried here. That he should be buried with his two companions. She knew how close they were. So when Abdullah ibn Umar comes back, Umar radiallahu anhu says to the people when he sees him coming back, make me sit up. SubhanAllah, look at how much enthusiasm. He's on his deathbed, he's dying. But he wants to sit up to see what news he will have. So Abdullah ibn Umar comes and he gives him the good news that Aisha has agreed. But he still says to Abdullah, his son, that when I pass away, when I pass away, go and knock on her door again with my body. So if she opens the door, bury me there. But if she doesn't open the door, it means she's changed her mind. So go and bury me in the graveyard of Baqir. Bury me with the rest of the Muslims. And when Umar radiallahu anhu was passing away on his deathbed, he chose that six people make a council, and from amongst these six people, the next Khalifa should be chosen. So he chose six of the seven remaining companions who were promised paradise by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
He chose Uthman and Ali and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Zubair ibn al-Awwam and Talha ibn Ubaidullah. He gathered these six and he said, one of you will be Khalifa and you should have a council, a shura and adv seek advice from the people and then choose the next Khalifa from amongst you. But there was a seventh one, a seventh one, who was also promised by a paradise by the Prophet wasallam, and who was still alive at that time. But Umar didn't include him. And he was Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu. And the reason why he wasn't included was because he was the brother-in-law of Umar and his first cousin. So he didn't want people thinking that he was appointing his own relatives, his own cousins, his own family members. So he said to him, no, you will not be part of the council. SubhanAllah, look at this, he's on his deathbed, he's dying. And if he had, if he had mentioned Sa'id, and he had said, make him the Khalifa, no one would have said anything. No one would have disputed. Because he's been promised paradise by the Prophet wasallam. He's one of the great companions. He was even a Muslim before Umar was a Muslim. He was the one whose house Umar went to in order to accept Islam. It was his, uh, Umar's sister was married to him. In the famous incident that led up to his Islam. But he said no. He will not allow him to become the next Khalifa. So there were six that were chosen. And to show furthermore his justice upon his deathbed, it went to such a level that when the prayer time came, the people came to Umar and he said, who shall we choose to lead the prayer? So Umar radiallahu anhu said, that if I choose one of the six, then the people will think that I am preferring him, that he is my preferred choice. And so they will make him the next Khalifa. So I don't want to influence the people. Don't let any of the six lead. Choose Suhaib al-Rumi, one of the other great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allow him to lead the prayers. So Suhaib al-Rumi would lead the prayers so that no one would think that Umar is trying to influence the outcome of this. SubhanAllah, look at this level of justice even upon his deathbed, even though he's on his way out of this world. And so even when he passes away, and the people want to read the janazah of Umar. Who did they choose to lead it? They say, let Suhaib al-Rumi lead. Because Umar didn't want anyone to influence the panel and the decision. So they allow Suhaib al-Rumi to lead. And before he passed away, one of the companions, radiallahu anhum, he saw in a dream. He was in Yemen at the time. And he saw in a dream that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was standing along with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Umar radiallahu anhu was standing off to a distance. So they said to them, so they both said to Umar, Oh Umar, what are you waiting for? Come and meet us. And so when the companion woke up, he realized that what it meant was that Umar radiallahu anhu would pass away. And so Umar radiallahu anhu passed away on that day, the 23rd year of the Hijrah radiallahu anhu arda. So this is like a brief glimpse into some aspects of the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. And inshallah, after Salatul Maghrib, will go on to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala and also the link between the two, how the two are linked. So inshallah if anyone has any questions, I'll take a couple of questions.